Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sober Truth Podcast. I'm George Wood, the Tattooed Pastor, and this week I'm honored to bring to you a guest, Brian Lane. He has a story that will bring tears to your eyes and hope to your heart because he has overcame challenges unknown to so many out there in the world today. But his story will give you an insight to so many issues that we have, whether it's in the foster care system in the way that we treat our teens in the way that we look at people that are going through homelessness it does, he, it's just let me just tell you his story will blow your mind but not only that his story is one that will now intersect with mine as you'll hear in the podcast that he is coming on board the sober truth project to be the COO of the organization so that him and I can work together and bring something into the world that hopefully transforms and changes lives. So as you're watching or listening to today's podcast, please keep in mind, you're gonna be hearing and seeing a lot more of this man, Mr. Brian Lane. So as always, please, if you haven't already, subscribe to the station, like the video and share it out so that those who need to hear a message like this can hear it. They can get their hands on it and they can realize that their life, no matter where they're at, there's always hope. Enjoy today, folks. Thanks. What's up, everyone? George Wood, Tattooed Pastor, and welcome back to the Sober Truth Podcast. And I got to tell you, today is a long time coming because, um, as you know, I have uh, been on this journey for the last few years, Sober Truth actually began in 2020, right before COVID, um, you know, founded with Amanda Sharp, Dr. Amanda Sharp. If, you, if you've seen some of the videos with her, um, she's now currently, she's went on, she was working for Harvard for a while, and now she currently works with SAMHSA. So she is, you know, doing big things in the world of uh, behavioral health and still, um, you know, in my life, in the life of the Sober Truth Project. But for the most part, I've been on this journey um, on my own and um, at times, you know, trying to find people that want to come and partner with me. But when you have a radical message of recovery that is different than the world has ever seen or heard, it's really hard to get someone that aligns with what you think, what you believe and what you want to bring into this world. Um, and I got to tell you, um, over the last year, I have become very good friends with the gentleman sitting next to me. Um, and Mr. Brian Lane is someone that is an inspiration to me. He's um, one of the closest friends I have in this world. Um, and he is someone that I have truly found a bond with, someone that I feel like um, this is somebody I could partner with and somebody I could um, go off into the dark night and find some light with. And I wanted to get a chance to introduce everybody to Mr. Brian Lane. And also, at the same time, for the very first time, make the public announcement that he is now going to partner with me with the Sober Truth Project. And as of last Friday, he is officially um, the COO of the organization. And he is going to tell us a little bit about himself today, and you will be seeing more of him. But today I wanted to be uh, making the announcement that this is the new COO of The Sober Truth. And Mr. Brian Lane, I am happy to be here with you and honored to be on this journey with you. Well, I can just say that uh, um, Sober Truth Project was good while it lasted. <laughs> now that I'm taking over. I'm going to rock this thing into the ground. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it's it's an honor, and um, it it happened organically. It, there was no you know compulsion in it or trying to make things fit. A lot of times, I feel like people in their journey are trying to force things, and when you just sit back and relax, things seem to just fall into place yeah. if you have the right mindset and the right heart set about your journey. And uh, and it's an honor. Um, and honestly, in my heart. It, as soon as it became a reality, I mean, I just, I felt it felt right. I mean, we've come up with some ideas and, and concepts that we thought, hey, maybe we can work together on this. Hey, maybe we can do this together. Um, but I really believe that uh, God was working things out mm -hmm. to where he was going to align us perfectly at the right time for the right reason. 
And so it's an honor to be here, and uh, it's an honor to see what God's going to do with this whole journey. Yeah, amen. You know, it's it's hard for people to understand when, you know, I, I talk about recovery, and I say, hey, yeah, I, I want to change the world, uh, and how they view recovery, and automatically people think of addiction. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. That's maybe a subset or a part of that. But what I'm really talking about is, um, you know, a human – the human's ability to be one with themselves and their authentic self and to be at peace with who they are and to be one with God, to be one with the universe, to be one with all that they could be in their lived out destiny. And we're all on this journey to some degree and addiction and mental health and suicide are definitely parts of that. But so is people that are in prison right now and prison ministries and uh, the homeless ministries that are right outside this window right now and all of these but they're also the person who's working 80 hours a week making a million dollars a year who doesn't know who he truly is or who she truly is so there's this aspect of recovery that I want to bring into the world and and you align with me in that way because you are so much into, you know, understanding things like breath work, understanding yoga, understanding how we become, um, you know, at peace within ourselves, not trying to strive to become something that we're not even supposed to be anyways. Um, all of this because of the journey that you've been on aligns perfectly with how I want to bring in what I want to bring into this world, which is a new way of even looking at, you know, who we are as, as human beings, as men and women, um, to live a life of authenticity, um, and, and, and peace within ourself because we are really living the life that we were destined to live. Yeah, I, I think, and it's well said, uh, I think the, I, unless, I, I mean, I'm just guessing at this, but I would say that the large part of the world suffers from what I call noun syndrome. And uh, it's people, places, and things that keep us from actually figuring out what we what we are, who we are, and where we're going to go. And um, you know, whether it's group peer pressure or you know, it's the local church that you're going to that's kind of resisting some of the ambition or maybe some of the uh, passion that you have, or or maybe you just want to fit in because what you are isn't exactly doesn't exactly look like your group dynamic. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times we find ourselves amiss and confused, and I think that's for everybody. And some people, unfortunately, when they can't find their place in the world, turn to things like substances. Some people end up in bad relationships, and, and they go through trauma in those relationships, whether you're male or female, um, and there's recovery in that too. And sometimes it's just about chasing the things of the world that really don't matter, all the stuff that you never, ever wanted in the first place, all of those things can be a, a deterrent from who we truly are and keep us from our destiny. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's about stepping away from that and entering into that recovery. It's kind of like you were talking about in the uncovery. You're uncovering truth, you know, by looking at what's really going on around and actually being brave enough, courageous enough to step back and say, you know, it may be lonely for a while. It may be kind of crazy. I'm going to be confused. I'm going to be afraid, but I'm willing to take this journey because, you know, I'd rather live out who I'm supposed to be than compromise for one more second. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's important. And I think that you can learn, there's many different tools in the world for people to be able to um, utilize. And some will be temporary for some people and some will be long-term for some people. And what those two tools were for that one person may not work at all for the next person. Mm -hmm. And so it's the journey of uh, self-discovery, the journey of, uh, of really cultivating that intimate relationship with the Lord mm -hmm. that is exciting to me. And I want to see the lights come on in people's eyes. Mm -hmm. And so however I can do that, whether it's by the highway or the byway, as the Bible says, or going into the prisons, going into the churches, going into the high schools, doing whatever, going, going into the homeless shelters. I don't care what it is. Let's get the message out. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that is of the utmost importance because everybody has a destiny. Everybody has a purpose. And I believe that it's guys like you and me and other people, uh, amazing women mm -hmm. and men mm -hmm. that are put on this play, uh, put on this earth, have gone through something that are going to help people come to that place of, I guess, aha or have that epiphany. 
Mm-hmm. And so I'm just grateful to be one of those people that are going to be able to help people realize mm-hmm. their purpose. I think, you know, I think what it is, is the, the world, um, and I, and I don't think it's just the, the world's fault. I think our brains tend to work in this way where to conserve energy, it tries to figure things out and then put it in a box. Um, and, and, you know, when we understand that, you know, M. Scott Peck in The Road Less Travel says, um, we begin dying the moment we stop making maps in our in our mind right when we when we stop mapping out the possibilities of this world of this life that we have of our potential and we become smaller and smaller it's almost like at one point we see everything is the whole world and that's all the potential we have but eventually we live in to a smaller and smaller little town. Yeah, whittled down. Yeah, whittled down. Like, this is all I know, um, all the way from our politics to the, you know, the vehicle we drive. I drive a Dodge. I'm a Republican, and I like short hair and, you know, whatever. You know, it's just like as few choices and options as I can think about, then that's where I am. But that's when we begin to die. And, and the reality is the world is always the same. It's The potential is always there, no matter where you're at. You always have all of this potential. And so when we look at things like how the rest of my life should look, um, often we have to go backwards and figure out how I even got to this place Mm -hmm. before I can fully understand what's in front of me. Because if I don't fully look at everything I've been through and all of the trauma that I've been through and all of the pain that I've been through and how I handled that and, and how have I healed from certain parts of that until I I can see all of that. I can't see what's in front of me. And, and it's just easier for, for us to just be like, this is all that's in front of me. These, this is all the potential I have. And, and, you know, I, I remember when I got into like recovery from addiction and people saying, well, there's 12 steps and that's what you, you, that's where you go. And I like being very discouraged because I didn't like the 12 step programs and I'm not knocking them. I'm just my personal beliefs. I didn't, I didn't resonate with them. And so I'm like, well, then I guess there's no chance for me. I, I had to go out and find out that there's other ways that people can recover. Right. Okay. And once again, not knocking the 12 steps. So please, if that works for you, then amen. But I I needed something different. And so that made me think, what other things are we limiting when we look at potential in life, right? Um, It's years ago, I was an athlete and I used to think, oh, you got to lift heavy weights and you got to lift them, you know, three to four times a week, low reps, meant not too many sets. And, you know, that's the only way you could work out. And then eventually you figure out like, oh, wait, you could do high reps and you could do stretching and aerobic exercise. And there's all these different things that we can do. But it comes from like recognizing, okay, I've been through some stuff. I need to process that stuff I've been through so that I can better understand how I move forward. Now, one of the things you're an incredible, you're one of the smartest people I've ever met. You're very capable in all different areas of life. I I could list all the different ways that you're very capable, but that's not why I wanted to partner with you. And that's not what attracted me to you. It's your life. And of people that have been through hell and back, you were right up there with somebody that's been through the most hell um, of anybody I know. And has made it to where you're at today and you still strive to get better every single day, which is so impressive to me. You're not resting on your laurels. You're not sitting back saying I've accomplished all this. You, you run another, a different company than this one. You have many jobs, you abilities, relationships all across the world, but you're not sitting back saying I've arrived. This is it. You're, you're every day seeking the will of God. You're seeking knowing yourself better. You're seeking healing from past trauma. You're, you're constantly trying to evolve. And that's the type of stuff that has attracted me to you. And I want our audience to know about you because it was not an easy start for you. If you want to share some of your story. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think for a lot of people, let's just say you have somebody who had it really good and then all of a sudden something terrible happens 
and they end up in a really bad place. So let's just say young kid loses his parents, ends up, and then there's nobody to take care of him. Before, when he had his parents, everything was safe, normal, and you know he was he was just living the life. But then all of a sudden you take that away, and their whole world's upside down, and they're being tossed around, and they went from love to no love. I, for me. I can't compare myself to that because that could be really devastating. I knew no love when I was young. Yeah. So, or any kind of healthy love because, you know, I was, I was born into an, uh, into an abusive household. I was abused as an infant. Not that I can remember that specifically. Um, I'm sure subconsciously it's imprinted, but, um, and so it was, it was being tossed around from the beginning, uh, to the, to the aunt and uncle, back to the to the abusive situation between my mother and, and uh, my father and then you know adopted off and then from there you know experiencing s- some love I remember that um, you know get adopted finally I'm in this good uh, this good holistic household dad's uh, a minister and a part-time cop and and um, uh, then that relationship between him and 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 my mother, my adopted mother, fell apart. And to me, that was more devastating because I was of age and she was all I knew as a mother, as coming of age. And once that happened, I went with her and then ended up, you know, she got married again. And it was, you know, I'm, I'm a remnant of a, of a failed memory or yeah. a failed idea. And so I ended up getting, putting it put back into foster, foster care. And so... I was I was in foster care for about a year before my adopted dad, who had gone off and done whatever I don't know, came back into the picture and came and started seeing me again, and then finally took me to live with him. And then you know, just trying to brush through this. By this time, I have some behavioral issues. You know, I'm a young kid that's just been all over the place. I don't understand what's going on with me, and I just you know I'm reacting to every single different. Uh, situation that arises in my life you're a young kid you're not supposed to be thinking philosophically by, about life at that time you know mm-hmm. existentially or whatever uh, you just want to play you want to play with your gi joes you want to know if, uh where you're going they've got kids you want to you want to know do they got a playground at this mcdonald's that's what a kid cares about when you're young that's that's all they should be focused on like maybe not mcdonald's but like it's yeah you know just the joys of being a child and uh but he ended up uh putting me into another group home at the time because he had to go do something. I, I'm not clear on the details, but by the time he came back for me, I ended up, or he was already with somebody else. And so in these group homes, by the way, I, I, I'd been abused by the staff and things. And things were a lot different back in the day. There wasn't all of these rules for, you know, kids were allowed to smoke in these group homes. I mean, it was just crazy. And they didn't have them divided. It was teenagers with little kids and, and all of that stuff like that. So I was exposed to sexual abuse and extreme physical abuse. I mean, at this time, the staff actually lived with the children. And um, and so when I got out of there, I was even more kind of just beat up and, and messed up. And, and uh, you know, so that was that was – that's really what my childhood l- looked like. It was just unstable, all over the place. And, and that's all I knew. Mm-hmm. So, like I said at the beginning of this, for a callback real quick, I can't compare it to somebody who had something and then lost it because it's devastating. Now, I know what that feels like later on in life. Yeah. But that could be even more devastating. All I knew was this. And so, for me, it was a normal. This is the way it is. This is how it's supposed to be. And, mm-hmm. and uh, my dad got remarried or my adopted dad got remarried and by this time I was troubled and I had a lot of behavioral issues and all I really wanted and I, and I used to say this over and over again all I really wanted was just to be with my dad that's yeah. it like you just I just wanted to know that he loved me and that he wasn't going to give me up and I used to make him promise I remember these please don't send me away again oh I promise Brian I'm never going to send you away this this is for real and and I you know, everybody's broken. Everybody's dealing with some level of tragedy in their life. Our parents are, and, and I'm glad that I've come to that now. But at the time, I didn't understand it. Yeah. And so, you know, I trusted. And, you know, then just, you know, the 
the the adoptive mom trying to come back into the picture, the real mother coming back into the picture, all of this chaos over time. And it just it just took a toll on me. And so my dad, my adopted dad, would rather deal with his new family than deal with me. Now, you can he can say, well, that's not what I – but it's the actions. It's what it looks like, not yeah. what it is. You mm-hmm. can have all the best intentions in the world, but – if you're if the result of that uh, of those intentions is not conducive to something uplifting and positive, then it's not what it is. That's not what you, what your intention right. was. Is not what happened. And so, like they say, good intentions pave the path to hell yeah. all the time, right? And uh, and so I ended up just being put back into the system and bouncing around from one group home to the next. And then finally, when I was seventeen. I got out of the system because I was graduating <laughs> from boy school. You know, there was no going back. Hey, he's too old. We're not going to keep him. Yeah. Get him out of here. And by that time, man, I, I just didn't have any roadmap to, you know, I didn't know how to fix a car. I didn't know how to change the oil. I didn't know how to pay a bill. I didn't, you know, my education was jacked up. I didn't, I, I literally was at an extreme disadvantage. Yeah. And uh, as far as just social skills and everything like that. Um, so the, all I, I was already institutionalized. So the, the next best thing from that was, okay, let's, let's join the military. Let's get into the military. Let's, I mean, it's going to be either free, you know, you're taken care of, you go in there, you just got to, it's just like being locked up and especially when you're going through basic training. But before that, um, my real mother came back into the picture and uh and so i went out to oregon and lived with her um for a while and and, and dude i'm giving you a fifty thousand foot view of course real quick. just i'm just jumping through real quick and we ended up you know getting uh she was like oh i'm doing so much better you should come out and meet your sister come stay with us and and blah 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 you know a couple months later she's in cahoots with the mexican mafia her boyfriend's a foot soldier in it and they're making mess i'm helping them make mess and Next thing you know, I'm shooting up meth with my mother at 17, and and uh, and so I, I remember one day I'd been up for like weeks, and uh, and I'm 17, and this is Portland, Oregon, 1996, and I remember just being like, I, I got to get away from this. I need to join that military that I was talking about, and and so I was walking outside in the morning. I was going to go steal the neighbor's paper, and the neighbor finally caught me. And I was like, whatever, dude. And he's like, put my paper down. Don't ever steal it again. I'm like, all right, 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 right. And so I turned around. And he's like, bro, you're gonna get, you're gonna go to jail over a paper. Some junkie dude that was coming over to uh, score some dope at my, my mom's house. And, and I was like, oh yeah, I know, man, it's messed up. And he goes, bro, I heard you were, riding a lightning or whatever. And I was like, what? And he was like, I heard you've been shooting it up, bro. You know, once a banger, always a banger. And I said. F that, bro. <laughs> I'm not doing this. So I just went back inside and went to sleep, woke up, grabbed my stuff, which wasn't much, uh, a few changes of clothing, and I ended up living in the streets of Portland, Oregon for probably close to a year, maybe nine months, somewhere in that range, nine months to a year. And, and I experienced a whole different world there. You know, there's a lot of young at the time, and I, I still think that is a problem out there, um, a lot of young kids that were homeless. There were fourteen-year-old yeah. girls. There were, yeah. and, and and like in the nineties, they didn't have that. Let's place them in the foster care mentality. They just, you know, they had little organizations where the kids could show up and get cared for. They had counselors and caseworkers, and and um, and so you know, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, uh, and I'd make my money, um, you know, babysitting young girls that were getting high on heroin, you know, so that they wouldn't get raped while. They were getting high. While they were getting high because you nod out and all of that. So, you know, I didn't do heroin at the time. And I was just getting off of doing needles with my mother, uh, crystal meth. And and so I was just done with drugs. Somehow I was able to escape that. And I'd shot up probably 20 plus times. And normally people who get past the first two or three times are done for for a long time. And so I was grateful for that. But I always had this deeper sense of, uh, of, and, and maybe it was because I got cut so deep as a child that caused me to develop a depth of character and analy- being analytical and philosophical and all of those things that made me think differently. Mm-hmm. Or some, as some say, I think God had a plan for my life. And mm-hmm. I believe that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I got exposed to just this 
insane life when uh, um, when I was out in Portland, Oregon, and uh, just watching those young, beautiful girls, uh, even these young boys, um, get, being stuck on this stuff. And, and, and I always had this curiosity, like, what's your story? Oh, how yeah. did you end up out here? Oh, my uncle molested me, and I had to run from home, or this, my dad was raping me or you know all of these crazy stories or you know i was in this relationship and and it went bad and and so i did that for a while and and then finally i got pneumonia because i'd been out in the, just the weather and i don't know in grimy dirtiness and uh the the caseworkers were threatening to file charges in oregon if my adopted dad did not take me back to indiana or help me get back to indiana so by force my dad had to send a plane ticket out there to avoid getting in trouble because I had a place to go and he was just being a knucklehead. Yeah. And, um, at the time, sorry, dad, I, we're good now, but, um, but a lot of people don't hear about that type of yeah. stuff is, I mean, we think of, I, uh, even when you told me this story the first time, I never really thought about that, but uh, kids get adopted a lot and we're always like, yay, you know, system works they got a you know child got it but what happens when that family divorces or what happens when they think they're not they're thinking uh they, they're they're seeing through rose colored color glasses oh i'm gonna adopt some kids this is gonna be great we're gonna raise them but then all of a sudden you run into their trauma how do you deal with that yeah and so a lot of people when they're making adoption decisions they're not thinking about what they're gonna have to deal with with this kid Maybe the kid was born on drugs. It's going to cause some chemical imbalances. Maybe the kid's been extremely abused. You ever adopted a dog from a shelter that's been abused? They're crazy a lot of times. Or, you know, it, it takes them years of trust to come out. As a matter of fact, I have a dog, uh, Brooklyn. She had been really abused. And uh, and it, for the first two years we had her, she would never, she would always be under a bed somewhere like a cat or, you know, would never come out. And it took her, like I said, two, two, two and a half years before she actually came and scratched on our door to actually come in our bedroom. And then slowly over time. And people don't realize the process or the continuum of things when it comes to dealing with children with, that have come from abuse, especially when they're yeah. doing adoption. So, and not just that, but I mean, people, human beings, we don't ever think of the story behind how the person ended up there, right? We just assume... Uh, the fallacy of choice. They chose to be a drug addict. They chose to be a jerk. They chose to be this type of person. Um, but w how often do we ever really think about what a person has been through to make them the way that they are? Well, it all boils down to this. Love me. Somebody love me. Mm. And, and at the end of the day, kids especially want to be loved. Uh, you know, when we get older, you know, a lot of us, you know, we're not, we don't think about the real world. We don't think about growing up and, and all we want to do, everybody wants to find meaning, purpose and someone to love them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and sometimes love can be a lethal thing, especially if it's coming, if it's unhealthy love coming from somebody who's coming out of chaos. And so, you know, a lot of these girls, a lot of these guys, have been loved the wrong way in their relationships with their parents and then in a relationship with their spouses or their significant others. Yeah. And so imagine, you know, you come from a broken home, you find somebody who says they care about you and they love you and they want to be with you. And that's the only love you've ever known. They show you affection uh, through physical touch, uh, through caretaking, through sex, through all of that. And that becomes your whole world. That becomes your center of gravity. Mm -hmm. And so when this person, if they mess up or they fall off and then they bring drugs into the, into the equation, you, you think to yourself, I'll never do that. But like, because you're so desperate for love, you'll do something that you normally wouldn't do. Yeah. And you see that with breakups when people do crazy stuff. Yeah. Love is, is if it's, if you don't have that healthy foundation, can really do some damaging things to you. It's not really love, but it's what we know is love. And so a lot of these girls, a lot of these guys ended up in places they never intended to be uh, because they got blindsided by unhealthy, toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. And that happened to me, you know, trying to find that love. And, um, 
you know, finally I got into the military, and um, and I did my I did my little time. Whole way through, I, I I just you know after I got in there and then I wanted to be free. Everybody gets locked up. They feel good at first. Well, I can't say they feel good at first, but for me, I felt good because I was like I'm safe. I, I, I'm taking care of. I'm in the military. I've got it going on. But then all of a sudden, I wanted to be free. So I was, it was this war within, and so I started rebelling even in, in the military, mm-hmm. acting out as a you know a grown child and uh, um, and just kept working towards getting out of the uh, military until finally they were like, dude, do you, are you just trying to destroy your life or do you want out of the military? And I was like, I, I want out. It was a horrible mistake, but they ended up giving me, uh, uh, you know, a, a med 200, which is, and, and it's also an enlistment line, an ELS, an enlistment line of separation so that I get out and still get some benefits and not get dishonorably or mm-hmm. anything like that. So they really worked to help me because a lot of people cared about me. I had, a, I had this, I had this ability to have an impact on people, <laughs> even uh, and uh, when I'm at my worst. And uh, I think it's just the hand of God on my life. And I think God's hand's not on anybody else's. But I'm just saying, like, sometimes God steps in, and yeah. we don't understand why for some and why not for others. I mean, from our own perspective, because our perception is limited. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know. I got out of that, and immediately I'm, I'm free in the streets, and so I just kind of hobo around, staying at people's places, um, smoking weed, you know, shacking up with girls, trying to just trying to find my way and, and getting jobs at, like, Burger King. And I remember one time, like, my dream job, this was the height of my, you know, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be, I wanted to be, uh, uh, make movies and stuff, so I was addicted to films. And so my dream job was uh, to work at a video store. But my confidence was so low. This is a guy who went through the military, too, just to give you. Uh, I made it through the military. I mean, as far as, like, the hard stuff was concerned. And um, who still didn't think he was good enough to get a job at a video store. And I just yeah. thought, man, I just, I'm yeah. not going to fill out an application there because they'll, they'll, you know, they'll see I work at Burger King or they'll see I do on this, and they're just going to say I'm not good enough or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I just wouldn't even believe yeah. myself enough. So I just... Drifted around, got a job, quit it when I got paid. I mean, I went to tons of jobs. I, I thought I was never going to get better from, you know, just being this habitual job quitter. <laughs> I'm serious, dude. I was like, I, and this is back in the late 90s. This is Bill Clinton era, man. There was a lot of jobs. You could quit one job, walk across the street, and get another job. I mean, <laughs> it was a really good time in America. But, uh, um, you know, so, you know, I, I, I started getting extremely addicted to weed. And it just kind of consumed my life because I like to be stoned. And when I was stoned, I didn't think. And, and I just was like, hey, bro, what's going on, man? Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> what's up, girl? What's going on? And so I had this uh, chemi- chemical courage, and, and, and it kind of filled the, the analytical gaps where between thought and action, I have this analyzation that just gets me low, low, low because I was just broken on the inside. The code was defective. Yeah. And, um, and so... I get into weed, and I'm like, God, man, i got to get off this weed. And so what do I do? I think I'm going to go get sober from weed, but really what I'm trying to do is be reincarcerated or, or institutionalized again. So I'm like, hey, adopt a dad. Dad, I need to get help for weed. And so I went to rehab for weed, which is kind of weird, um, especially in the late 90s, <laughs> especially now. But I don't know. Everything's messed up. So I go down there, and I ended up getting into some uh, – recovery situations and 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 really giving it a shot and mind you like i said i'm giving you a fifty thousand foot view i dabbled in all kinds of drugs in between you know with the weed yeah of course i think it was right before uh right before i went down there i had this little excursion with crack cocaine for like a week (laughs) and i was like man i've got to get help weed's really destroying my life and and uh so i went to rehab and but i got out of there and 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 met a girl and started, you know, running around with her, started smoking weed again, decided I was going to tr- try my hand at school, enrolled in IU and, and uh, with a GED and a uh, Christian high school diploma, whatever that means. And, uh, and I got in somehow, some way into the school of psychology and because um, I scored high enough. I was never dumb, but, you know, it's just I just wasn't. I didn't pay attention in school. It's just yeah. kind of weird how that works. And uh, um, after that, 
Hey everyone, just wanted to peek my head in here into this video or podcast that you're watching or listening to and say, please leave some comments. I can't get you guys to leave me comments. Please leave some comments below. Let me know what you're thinking. Give me something to interact with so that we together can figure out what we need to do in order to transform and change lives. So leave comments below. That. Um, I, I just kind of drifted around. I really didn't focus on my studies. I, I used to go to school and I cut into some classes that I was just interested in. Like I, I, I tried to double major for a while. Then I was like, you know what? I, I don't really know if I want to do this. And I was unstable in my schooling as I was. But I would just jump into like humanities class or political, uh, what is it called? Uh, poli sci. Love that. Got in there, listened to those stuff. And classes I would take just, I wouldn't even know my reg register. I just wanted to. I was just there to, for the social experiment, really, <laughs> I, or experience, I should say. Yeah, yeah. And so I started hanging around uh, a bunch of a bunch of people, a group of people that were, you know, they were part LGBTQ, and and uh, they were always partying. So I I was attracted to that, and they were really accepting. So like it was like, oh man, I, I found my people, and uh, they were doing ecstasy and and uh, and partying, and so I got involved in that. And then I started my I tried my hand at DJing at a club. And uh, selling ecstasy at the same time, and next thing you know, it was just on to debauchery and and you know orgies and drugs. I mean, all kinds of drugs. And you know, one minute they're yelling, "Man, he's in a K hole," or "Bro, he's you know he's really tripping." You know, I, whatever drugs were there, I used to think it was some kind of spectacle. I'm like, dude, I've got five drugs in my system right now, dude. This is so awesome. I'm doing five drugs. To me, those were accomplishments, you know, because I thought that I was living the life. You know, I had all the sex I wanted. Um, I had all the girls. I mean, we decided to, to, to try our hand at the adult film industry. Um, it just got crazy. That's how crazy I was. I just descended into this madness while, all the while trying to be an entrepreneur, I guess. Um, but I was a bad one. <laughs> and, and drugs consumed me. And, you know, and I'm going to just fast forward a little bit i just ended up ultimately getting into the streets or getting on the crack cocaine and and back on meth again and i mean i lost my mind a couple of times along the way and next thing you know i'm in the streets of indianapolis just going going crazy just living for crack cocaine just in and out of jail in and i ended up getting arrested like 40 plus times and then i went to prison six times I served collectively in prison about seven years, seven and a half, something like that. I'm not, I'm not going to do the math on that, but, um, I mean, but the Lord was with me through all of those experiences, and I'll share some of those. I had some incredible supernatural encounters when I was living in the streets, and I mean that's a whole different story, and it's way too long to go into. But you know, I, I, I was in the gutter. I was as grimy as it gets i mean i was robbing people running guns breaking into places i mean the the life that i led on the streets i mean it, it was insane and i remember having this distinct conversation with the lord one day and i was walking down the street and i was like lord i know this isn't going to last forever but this is where i'm at and i'm stuck on this stuff it, it gave me a purpose like i like a lot of people get a career yeah nba um, CEO or some kind of direction, crack became my passion. Drugs. How could I be the best possible crackhead, po you know, out there? How can I hustle the yeah. most money without having to do the most uh, most work? It didn't work out too well in the beginning. I mean, I was grimy. You know, I was the guy in the parking lot. I was like, hey man, uh, half half out of it, just trying to get somebody to buy me a cheeseburger. That's back when I didn't eat enough and uh, like a cheeseburger from McDonald's tasted like a T-bone steak or a ribeye. I mean, you'd, you'd take a bite of it, you'd be so hungry. Uh, you'd take a bite of it, and, and uh, it would just, like, cause you to go into some kind of mental food gasm. And, yeah. And it was because I was so freaking hungry. But, you know, I felt like, and again, even in this, I felt a sense of purpose and a calling beyond what I was going through. Well, you were Islam in, in Islam as well, right? It's a whole other podcast. So, okay, like, we'll go to another. Yeah, yeah, well, hey, it's a whole, got, there's so much going on here. I'm trying to keep this thing. Keep, let's keep it, yeah, yeah keep it streamlined. So, <laughs> um, so, 
it's it's uh you know at some point now i've always had a relationship with god whether it was in islam or christianity and i had a special place in my heart for jesus always it's there was something about jesus even in the quran um that just really compelled me towards him and uh it's, there's nothing, honestly, to, to segue real quick. There's, show me any story throughout history. Show me any message throughout history that is like the story of Jesus and the gospel. Right. There is not. And I've studied. I've looked. You get some compassion from Buddha. You get some, you know, you, the Hindus have got some good concepts. But there is, there is no other story. There's no other message like the message the pure we're not talking about the, the political yeah, about yeah, the yeah pure unadulterated gospel for like what paul said for i'm determined to know nothing among you except jesus and him crucified mm -hmm. that simplistic message of the gospel yeah and 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 just knowing that there's nothing better there's nothing better than that that message of hope and so you know i i don't always speak in those in those terms but for me that was the ultimate uh, deal maker, I should say, yeah. as far as like pulling me up out of the streets, and um, and how God, how I encountered God in the midst of my brokenness, and how He showed up and it, He turned upside down the religious establishment. You know, when I was younger, a lot of people said God won't talk to you if you're you're broken and busted and and, mm -hmm. and are living in sin. Matter of fact. When I thought I had it together, God, God was silent. When I was at my worst and most brokenness, God was hanging out with the homies, yeah, and 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 showing up and speaking to me and and walking with me and providing, you know, making sure I didn't get killed. And that's the kind of God that I want in my life. He's He's with you even at your worst. And, and I love like when I read the Bible, and I see crazy stuff. Like when we just talked beforehand, you know, Samson's in the bed with a, with mm -hmm. a hooker, basically. Yeah. And the and Holy Spirit's like, hey, what's up, bro? Your parents are outside. You know, <laughs> like he's coming in to hang out with the dude. So, like, it's the true message of the gospel turns upside down and puts it on its head. The message of, like, this crazy extremist um, evangelicalism that's pretty popular right now. And so... That's where I want to live, and, and that's what saved me from the streets. And getting back to, you know, where I was, it's God, you know, when I was out there and I was meeting all these people, same story, only this time I was a participator from Portland, Oregon, when all those young girls and all of those broken people, I was fascinated by people's stories. You know, you'd meet these, some people that used to be, you know, one guy was a one-star general at one point in his life. And now he's a, a dope fiend running the streets, doing heroin and crack and whatever. You know, another person was a high powered executive or, you know, this beautiful young girl that comes out. I remember her name was December. She was so precious. And, uh, you know, she had just been abused in this relationship and it led her to her kids being ripped away from her by this evil maniacal man who was broken, you know, we'll leave it there. But he he won. Sometimes evil wins, and it yeah. breaks goodness. And and this girl ends up out there, and, you know, six, seven months later, she's dead. You know, yeah. like there's – and then the, the relationships you develop in the streets, even with the dope dealers, you know, you become in, interwoven, as we talked about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We come – with the whole atmosphere, the, the, the whole game itself with the neighbors, with the, the social economic vibe sometimes just pulls you in. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, because you're looking for love and even if it's toxic and you're looking for belonging, even if it's toxic and once you're locked in and a lot of times it's not even the drugs that keep you coming back. It's the people, places and things. Mm -hmm. It's an noun syndrome. And, uh, and so, you know, listening to those people's story, um, you know, I lost my, my wife or, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I just never could make something of myself or I was abused or my kids, I uh, lost my kids. You know, there was always a tragedy that brought these people to the places that they were. And so I was fascinated by that. And, and all of that hurt, all of that sorrow, all of that pain, and in the midst of it, we're sitting there breaking bread with drugs. 
you know, just trying to be there for one another. Yeah. You know, we didn't really know each other. And so I said in that prayer that one day, it's like, Lord, look, this is not where I want to be, but I know that this is where I am and I'm not going to give it up anytime soon, or at least that I'm aware of. But I know I love you and I know I want to be loved by you and I know I want more for my life. And I said, look, I'm going to be the best crackhead. I'm going to be the best at this until the time is up. I was like, so Lord, if you could just walk with me, keep me safe and be with me and Lord, help me to be a blessing to somebody. I, I, I may not be able to be a pastor or a minister or, you know, mm-hmm. but I know I can help push somebody's car off the road if it's, if it's broken down. I know I can walk a blind man across the street. I mean, I know I can help somebody take the trash to the curb. I know that I can do these things. So allow me to be a blessing to somebody and bless anybody who blesses me. And that was my philosophy out, out, out there. And the Lord it's a beautiful really, prayer. Yeah, and, and the Lord really looked out for me. And, um, and, but it was a painful process, a lot of you know, almost dying, a lot of getting you know, beaten to within an inch of my life, a lot of running through gunshots, seeing people die. You know, there's a lot of trauma, um, a lot of abuse, being abused by you know, really bad people who were selling drugs. Um, you know, I got raped when I was out there, dude. It like, it's, uh, and that's crazy to say as a grown six foot three freaking at one point, 280 pound man. But like, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's just the facts of life. And so it, it was, it, it was messed up. So I'm just grateful to be here. And, you know, in all of that pain, pain and uh, uh, tragedy, I was able to really learn some things. Yeah, that were knowledge at first, but they've grown into wisdom, I believe. And as long as I keep practicing the the correct principles in my life, and I want to be able to take what I've learned through all the chaos, through all the confusion, um, all the things that I've, you know, self incurred trauma or the trauma I've got had happened to me that that wasn't my fault specifically. I mean, maybe I made the decision to be there, but you know, I didn't cause this dude to pull a gun on me or whatever. Right. You know. Um. It's, I want to, I want to, I don't, I want to prevent as many people from being a December mm. as possible. It's beautiful. Yeah. To, to, to bring them out and with the knowledge that everybody's in a continuum. So it could be year one for somebody who's, you know, out there struggling with addiction and they may not get sober for another 10 years. So to me, Year one is just as important as the 10th year because I can remember so many times the Lord would send somebody across my path that would say something to me that would impact me greatly in that moment but didn't come, didn't sprout, didn't grow into my life until six years later. But they were all catalysts in helping me get sober. So I'm not worried. You know, the Bible says there are some who scatter, some who, you know, harvest, mm-hmm. but it's him, him that gives the uh, increase. increase, right? It's, it's, he's the God that gives the increase. So we just got to be faithful with our, 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 our seeds, the pl- things that we plant in people's lives and be mindful of the words that we speak and, uh, and let God do what he's good at and just keep praying for the will of God in people's lives and, and, and even in our own and the power to carry that out. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you never know. So it could be year four, and the person's going to get sober two years from then. But I'm going to act as if each time, and I'm going to plant those nuggets, and I'm going to give them the tools, and I'm going to speak life, uh, truth to power, not religious religiosity, but we're going to speak personally. Hey, like, this is what you're going through. I've been through that. Or you know, just relating to the individual and then empowering them with the tools that they can have to utilize at any given point in their in their walk to to recovery, whether it's just from an abusive relationship, mm-hmm. a, a, a life in prison, um, or abuse or drug abuse, whether you go to prison or jail or not. Some people are functional addicts, and they want to get better. Maybe the successful entrepreneur who's only been about money, and and all they care about is making that money, and they're really good at it, but they don't know who they are, and they're coming to a point of moral crisis or. And I want to be able to step into that person's life and, and help them because the seeds of life are for everybody. They're not just for the recovering addict. They're also for the people who think they've, they've mm-hmm. got it together or for the person who's just recovering from maybe stepping out of some kind of cult, some kind of 
uh, political uh, organization because sometimes these things can drive us mad. You get on Facebook, next thing you know, you want to go out and you know throw throw revolution fist in the air. You know that's it, it, the society, society is designed to do that to people for some reason. Yeah, it's called evil. Yeah. But people who want to pull away from that and live a life of meaning and purpose, that's my calling. And so I want to give them all the tools, the tips and the tricks, whatever, the, the life hacks uh, <laughs> necessary to do that. Yeah. And so I'm just glad to be here. That's it. So, you know, I think it's, I know, like, we've spent days on end talking. So I know, like, all the the story and all the parts he's left out and all that we could sit here, this would be a four hour podcast. So, and then still not cover everything that, that we've talked about. But I, I think the gist of it is that you're just somebody who's been through hell and back and you want to help other people to avoid the same, same issues, the same problems, because it's interesting. What people don't recognize, I think is that everything is a reaction to the pain and isolation that, we feel from early on, but then we end up in these lifestyles where we incur more trauma and more pain. Uh -huh. And so it's like cyclical. So it's like the stuff that sent me down this road actually is in all the pain because then I incurred a bunch more pain oh, on the journey. Mm -hmm. and, and we get further and further from the life that God wanted for us to have. Right. And I think one of the things beautiful you didn't cover so far today is you went into your last prison stre stretch and actually the Lord delivered you 30 days in. And then you spent like three more years sober in the in your right mind in prison, sort of like honing the person that you came out of that prison stretch right. becoming. Yeah. Well, he, I think if I had it to do all over again, I'd ask the Lord to deliver me from the emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, Lord, let me work on the drugs, but deliver me from this emotional trauma. Deliver me from all of these things so I don't have to work through all of that. Because getting off the drugs is the easy part. Yeah. It's dealing with all of the crap that's been unchecked in your life that is the most difficult part. And that's what keeps people coming back to the, yeah. to, to the same old destructive behaviors. It's the, the, the false beliefs that we've adopted throughout our lives about um, things like such as if, if you don't get it here, you're going to be hard pressed to find it anywhere. False belief. Right. You know, like if there's, there's all of these things that we've come to know that are, they just need to be wrecked. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Jesus coming into the temple and turning the tables over. There's so many things you can extract from that story. It's not just the money changers. It's the false belief systems that we've adopted in our yeah, lives. About yeah. Life and ourself. And one of the biggest things that is really difficult for any person who's getting sober, we never grew up. Mm. So we're still children. And grown bodies. Yeah. And we just want mommy and daddy. We want that love. And we don't know how to grow up. We, we don't, you know, we see it on TV, you know, but it's, it's, it's TV. It's not real. Or you see people have it together and you're like, man, I wish I could. But, you know, they always just get up there and tell you, oh, it was one day I was praying and all of a sudden God and bam, here I am. You know, there's no story. It's like, what the crap, dude? Lord, <laughs> please help me. So we got this false idea of what, how, how, recovery works some it's overnight some it's a long period of extended time yeah 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 and, and for those who let me just say this for those who are seeking the shortcut trying to play the scratch off and win the lottery as far as like getting sober really fast or getting your life together really fast it's those who go through the process of working on their emotions that gain the deep wisdoms and insights that help other people get on the road to recovery. So I'd much rather go through the process of pain and difficulty of my own uh, inappropriate behavior, my own mess ups and setbacks than ever to just be delivered like yeah. that. Yeah. So God knew what I needed to do, he, uh, what I needed, I should say, let's get rid of the drugs and let's let them work through this. And what a process it's been. It's been ugly, it's been up and down and all around and, and it's just been uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but as you get older, it does get better. And um, the, more you, the more you surrender, the faster your process is. The more you surrender to the reality that this is going to take some time, that you didn't get here overnight. Yep. The more you surrender to the reality of, you know, I'd love to just jump up there and go preach across America or 
get up there and you know be the most famous podcaster or get up there but you got to put the work in and a lot of that work is soul work and so i th- if people can get a realistic expectation of what to expect hey this is what's going to happen all the way down from the f- physiological responses to the biological uh reality of things what's going on with me why all of a sudden am I addicted to porn? I was delivered from drugs. Why all of a sudden am I, you know, a sex addict? And, you know, I was explaining those things, breaking them down, giving people the tools and, and information necessary for them to fight a good fight. It's, easy, it's, it's, it's difficult to fight an enemy when you don't know its position. But if you can break down the, st- uh, the strategy of the enemy mm-hmm. and you can break down the, the knowledge of what the enemy is, you can best navigate uh, and survive it and, yeah. and sometimes thrive on top of it most of the time. And, uh, you know, so I, I that's what I, I think that the, I don't think that's what I believe that the sober truth project is. Yep. And I'm excited mm. and, and I don't get passionate about very many things. You know, uh, I've been passionate a lot about a lot of dumb things, <laughs> uh, like crack. Um, <laughs> he mentioned the crack earlier. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be uh, the best the, crackhead in the world. I, I literally made that commitment. <laughs> I, that was my first career. Like, yeah, literally, yeah. like, you know, single people get go through career changes mm-hmm. every 10 years or something like that. I'm like, all right, well, you know, yeah. crack was my first. What's my second? You know, confusion. I was like, oh, I want to do this. No, I want to do this. Oh, I think I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to be an evangelist. I'm going to be, you know, Jesus, Lord. I look back on a lot of that stuff, like line dancing and Billy Ray Cyrus and Aki Berkey Hart. <laughs> And so it's, it's, man, helping people understand, like, like I said, my, giving them the, the truth about their situation, mm-hmm. the, uh, the diagnosis, and then giving them the prognosis, you know, like, here's how we're going to get it better. Here's how we're going to, here's how it's going to take. And this is what to expect most likely. And here's the arcs. Here's the here's the crescendos of some things, and then here's the crash. Yeah, and, and just walking them through and, and, and teaching them how to rewire their brain, and it's going to take some time, and it's not going to be easy, but man, it's so worth the effort. And a lot of people think to themselves as failures because they never started out to 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 start a business or started out to you know cre- to, to be some famous influencer which seems like everybody wants to be these days or this or that i want to be known i want to be famous or whatever or i want to you know <laughs> just survive so maybe I mean, whatever it boils down to but and we look at terms of like you know you got to fail forward in order to succeed you know that's on personal stuff too that's not just starting businesses that's not just you know, becoming successful as a podcaster, it's character development. Yeah. And sometimes we go this way and we're like, and then we find out that that's not truly who we are. So we got to start all over again. But the, the, the old adage is true for all of it. You, you keep failing at something, you're finally going to succeed at another. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, that's here. That's where I'm at. It's, I'm going to challenge everybody's subconscious bias right now because I imagine you don't think you have bias, but let me just put it this way. My guess is if you know you don't know who Brian is, um, you're probably still listening at this point, and you're probably thinking, oh, that's really great. You know, George has another, you know, drug addict, you know, guy to work alongside him. It's nice. We didn't even get into his business successes. So he's not like he just told you the the rough story. But the subconscious bias of the human mind is to think lump you in that category of, oh, that's great. Those two ex drug addicts got some microphones and a video camera. They can they can put some stuff out into the world. And believe me, people think that way. And before I let people know I was in recovery years ago when I got into ministry and uh, I would have churches ask me to preach. But when they found out I was actually in recovery, then it became, well, you could come and talk to the small group. I'm the same person that you thought I was. But now that you know that I come from this background, you automatically lump me into this other category. 
So let me just say this. You may think Brian's in this, that category. He runs, he has his own successful business. He's worked with famous people all over the world and helped them build their personas. He's highly skilled. He's, trust me, he's got the credentials to back up the things he wants to talk about, not just the lifestyle behind it. You know, and I've messed up a lot along the way. So, you know, I've had fallen outs with people. So it's not perfect on, on this side, but the, the goal is striving to be better each day, learning, learning the process of learning from your mistakes. Yeah. And, and, and really setting it and, and not avoiding uh, the, the trauma or the pain of rejection, you know, and understanding that process and how it can really lead to a fulfilling life when you're able to actually say, you know what, this is who I am, and I'm not going to compromise it for anybody. I'm not going to be loud and obnoxious with it, but I'm going to walk a straight line yeah. when it comes to who I am. I, I saw this on, on this story on uh, uh, TikTok or something the other day. It was about the differences between buffalo or bison and cows when a storm comes. Buffalo or bison, I, should, I, I, I think they're, I don't know if they're just one and the same or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, But the whole point is, is there's a difference between these two animal groups and the cows they can both of them have the the ability to sense the storm several hours before the storm comes but the reaction to it is different the cows when the storm comes they start running or they start heading in the opposite direction they keep going 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 and trying to get away from the storm but ultimately they get overwhelmed by the storm but they keep running from the storm so it's crazy yeah. so they end up staying in the storm yeah the bison on the other hand run towards the storm and get through the storm as fast as possible so they run towards interesting it and they keep running through it as the storm passes over them and then they're out of it whereas the cows on the other hand they get stuck in the storm and they stay there and they get traumatized even more and a lot of us in life we do the same thing we run from the scary stuff we run from the trauma we run from the confrontations yeah. And or the hurt and the pain and we want to retreat, but all we're doing is running in the storm and running in the same direction with it. So it and prolongs it, just, it. It creates the compound effect and it just pulls us down, 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 down. When we're like, you know what? <laughs> you know, like the dude on uh, Jamie Kennedy, I am the White Kong. You know, on, <laughs> yeah, on the, you know, yeah. Uh, Malibu's most wanted. Yeah, we need to <laughs> Malibu's most wanted the storms in our life. You know, uh, because it will be painful. It will hurt, but. The more we embrace the struggle, the more we encounter uh, the pain of it, the more we accept what's going on in our lives, the quicker we can heal and build from that point. And so that's awesome. Yeah, that's a, what a story. great. Yeah. You know, it's beautiful. I didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't make that up. So like somebody else they didn't get the credit for it, but I thought it was fascinating. Well, I, I mean, the bison made it up. But it's, something, <laughs> something right? right? Let me see here. Let's watch these two groups of animals. You know, I, I see all kinds of interesting stuff on the Internet. Uh, <laughs> some of it's real. On some the there. web, you know, on the Google. Uh, but on the Google. On the Google, on the Facebook. That's what they used to call it. But, um, <laughs> you know, you see, you see all of these crazy stories. Regardless if it's real or not, great analogy. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I love it. Um, I can say this, the thousands of people I've worked with over the year in, in addiction, the, the, those that are, they tend to make matters worse by running from confrontations because you're, you're always going to have confrontations with people. And so the more you can become adept at dealing with things head on, the better your life is going to be. You know, there's, there's a lot of great wisdom in the 12 steps. So mm -hmm. I'm not anti-AA, I know you're not either. So right. 12 steps. But there's so much great wisdom. Um, you can learn a lot from a knucklehead and Bill W was just another knucklehead out there like us. Yep. And, um, and, and so much great wisdom. Learned in foolery and buffoonery, literally. Some of the greatest nuggets come from some of the biggest idiots. Um, and, and they had to learn it the hard way. Yeah. And so I'm one of those guys. But, you know, First thing, and I, and I got segued on earlier talking about something else. We have to learn to take ourselves serious. We don't even know what that is. What is that? I mean, super serious? We had to, to go back to even re-educate ourselves about some of the words that we've even learned and what their implications are for our lives. And, and, and taking ourselves serious as a legit person. Love starts with you. Um, you, you get into the... 
to the mirror and love that person regardless of whether you feel it or not. Mm -hmm. And you start to take yourself serious as an important contributor to this world. And so teaching people, that's the, the beginning. The, the first thing I do with somebody is we assess where we're at. Like, what have you been, where have you come from? What have you gone through? I mean, it's the classic, like, so tell me a little bit about Yeah, this. man, man. And, and where are you trying to go? And a lot of times people don't know. They think they know. Um, but as we unpack a lot of stuff, we find out that they don't even have the presence of self-awareness and self-love and self-compassion. Let me have it a little bit. Oh, the shoes and these pants look nice on me. I go to the gym and blah, blah, blah. But they still don't see themselves as a person. They're absorbed into their environment. And so as soon as we can help them identify and have that self-love and self-awareness mm -hmm. and set them on the journey to experiencing what that is through, you know, proper belief and structures and, and, and yeah. thought processes through meditation, through affirmations, through stretching for the religious folks, for the non-religious folks, yoga, <laughs> um, you know, those things uh, – you know, yeah. out there that are that are there. He, you know, God created this incredible thing called the body, the human body. Yeah. How amazing is it? Um, and there's nothing like it. Not at all. You can create AI all day, and I love AI. But it's not human. And so here we are with these amazing bodies. He's saying, just allow me to be the Lord of your life. You do that. But then he also wants you to honor the temple to to master the temple mm -hmm. to, to take care of the temple what is that what does that even mean so we break down all of that stuff we walk them through that stuff and and i know that's what we're going to do at the sober truth project yep. and i know that's what you've been doing already so we break all of that stuff down and we teach them how to be the master of their own minds yeah it's not perfect it's flawed and not every not one size fits all that's the uniqueness of the journey, and we find out what works for you, and we set you loose. I love it, man. Yeah. I think you, you get a pretty good idea why I want to work with this guy and why he is now the chief operating officer of the Sober Truth Project. And I'm so excited about what the future holds because um, I think when – it's just me. I, I tend to fall into a lot of the negative consequences of a human being like anybody, anybody would. You start to believe, you know, I can't do this or I can't do that or I'm trying to do this. And so you kind of, in a way, you limit yourself and you need that other person to come along and say, no, this is what we can do. This is the true potential in front of us. Absolutely. And you're my guy for that. So. Boom. Boom. So here's to the future, Bob. <laughs> Looking here's... forward to meeting uh, Dr. Amanda Sharp. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the courageous co-founder. <laughs> the courageous co-founder. Sober Truth Project. But, um, yeah, man, so we're going to be, over the next few weeks, we're going to be redoing everything from the website to the way we present ourselves to the logos to the logos. Uh, no, that's just yeah, to the logos. To the logos. <laughs> But we, we're just going to revamp everything, rethink everything, and I'm excited to be doing it with this guy. So thank you guys for tuning in. You're going to be part of what we're doing in the future. Uh, let me just say this because we get so self-absorbed and this podcast was kind of about my story. I think working with you is going to be exceptional because you've got all of this history, um, uh, you know, just grinding, doing what it takes, making, making stuff happen when there was – there's no possibility of it happening. You built the Timothy Initiative from the yep. ground up. You did, so, and that's just a couple of the organizations. So I'm going to take this opportunity to brag about you. You've established connections, relationships. I mean, everybody in Tampa who works in anything that has to do with any kind of recovery or you know mental health or wellness knows who who yeah. you are, and and it's all the way up in even into Tallahassee. You know, yeah. people know who you are, and you've you've really established yourself. So. You know, I can bring crazy, silly, goofy wisdom, but dude, you bring you bring the heat when it comes to the things that you've done and accomplished. I mean, what you've done. I mean, when I when I first went into that to that men's program over there, Timothy Initiative, uh, I was blown away. Yeah, I was like, you're telling me this guy did that? You, know, like, <laughs> you did, bro. So I mean, you're just yeah. phenomenal at what you do. You ran a construction company and you, you're self-taught in that and. 
I mean, it's just fascinating. So I'm more excited to be working with somebody who actually knows what the, you're doing, uh, they're doing, and versus yeah. the guy who's like, yeah, man, here's a good idea, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, we're going to be coming. I can tell you this: we're going to be coming to high schools. We're going to be going to the middle yep. schools. We're going to be going to the rehabs. Or at least I will. I think he's yeah. he's going to drag me there too to the to the courthouses to the wherever we're going to be there. Coming soon. That's Coming it. soon, like and we're there to 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 help and talk. Not we're not going back to court. Yeah, or to, yeah. <laughs> no prison sentences for this guy. You know, <laughs> I think I've missed a year in taxes. I'm still worried about that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be taking care of that this year. <laughs> if the government's watching, we're. <laughs> I promise, dude, it was a mistake. You know, <laughs> I just gotten out of prison and I forgot about tax season. Uh, <laughs> I don't know I mean, yeah, man. Um, this is it, man. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. So how about that story, right? Man, I got to tell you, I, as a podcast interview person, never thought I'd be sitting across as someone said some of the things that Brian said in today's episode, right? Probably shocked a few of you, but it's important that you realize that there are people out there that stories are vastly uh, worse than you can imagine. And as we interact with one another, hopefully stories like this give us the ability to have compassion and empathy, where maybe um, we've prejudged other people and thought we knew what they'd been through, when in reality, we have no idea what another person has been through. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. You'll be hearing more from Brian as, as we go on with The Sober Truth. And you know what? We may say more things that will blow your mind as the time goes on. So thanks everyone for tuning in. If you haven't already, please leave some comments below. Let us know what you're thinking and we will see you or you'll see us next time. Peace.